Million Lint. This is a very interesting project. And no, it's not just another alternative to Biome or ES Lint or all those things. It's very different from your usual linter. In order to understand why Million Lint's interesting, I think you need to understand Million a little bit first. The goal of Million is to make an alternative compiler for React, kind of similar to the React compiler work going on, but this is way earlier, originally by a high school kid that's now a Y Combinator founder who's absolutely killing it. It was an alternative to React DOM that could be up to 70% faster. And people have been using it and getting insane performance. There's a bunch of companies listed here that have actually shipped Million in production. And the speed you can get is pretty nuts. It's a cool project, but why do we care about their linter? Well, unlike every other linter I've seen before, theirs is focused on performance. What the hell does performance in a linter mean? Let's talk about it. Million Lint is in public beta. It's launch time. After three months and hundreds of commits, we invite you to try out Million Lint. The experience is not finished. There are a few known bugs and several missing features. We are really happy with how it's shaping up and couldn't wait to share it with you. You can get started in one command by running this in any React app. npx at million slash lint at latest. A little guide for if it doesn't work too. I also love these. Having these little commands that you run in a project that are like a CLI that scaffolds it for you instead of instructions of put this here, put this here, put this here, put this here, then do this, then sign up here, and then maybe it works. Just a CLI that does it all, something I've actually been looking into doing for upload thing. So you just run a command and it sets it up for you. So what is Million Lint? Million Lint is a VS Code extension that keeps your React website fast. We identify slow code and provide suggestions to fix it. It's like ES Lint, but for performance. Now do you see what I mean by performance? Many developers try to use tools like React DevTools to find unnecessary renders. Unfortunately, most lack the knowledge to properly manage this complexity. See the difference between React DevTools and Million Lint. Yeah, I'm a React DevTools fan and I can defend a lot of it. This is not easy to parse. Uh, we, we see our favorite good old styled components and a popper wrapper on top. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me in the slightest. But if we compare this to Million Lint's output, you get the profile in VS Code itself. Function node button, you hover over, it renders 2,154 times. It takes 202 milliseconds. With children, it takes 400. And 1,500 instances are rendered copies. Actual feedback in your editor. Really interesting. Complicated tools mean developers give up. Every developer knows his experience. We insert a console log everywhere, catch some promising leads, but nothing happens before the time runs out. Eventually, the slow and buggy code never gets fixed, problems pile up on a backlog, and our end users get hurt by the performance issues. You sure there's no better way to surface these performance issues though? You versus profilers. Existing instrumentation tools like Sentry, Datadog, Highlight's cool too, lots of those tools. These show you the entire universe of web data. That includes a lot of annoying things like a Chrome extension crashing. To this day, I think I've gotten more Sentry reports about Honey, the Chrome extension, than my own code. Because Honey, the Chrome extension, does all sorts of weird shit with your DOM and breaks the sites that I've built many, many times and just throws errors in the console. And those get sent to me. Even though I'm not the one who built Honey, I built the website that you're going to with Honey installed. Blech. Yeah, having this be at your code base level makes it significantly easier to deal with. This can include every function call, network request, user interface, core web vital, screenshot, memory, and a dizzying amount of information to process. Yeah, if you ever opened up Sentry on like a big project with a lot of users, chaos. As such, these tools have interfaces that are overwhelming. As for React and Chrome DevTools, they are simply unusable if you don't know what you're doing. And even if you do, it's hard to tell which part of the component re-rendered or which hook or prop caused that change in the first place. A flame graph doesn't give you cause and effect, a flame graph just gives you stats. Unless you're an expert, the current experience of performance debugging is hostile to most developers. But let's be real, you're probably not an expert. Because if you were an expert, you'd already have subscribed to my channel. I don't know if you know this, but subscriptions are actually free. So if you hit that button, we'd appreciate it. Anyways. Compiler or runtime. JavaScript compilers enable us to perform static analysis on source code. For performance optimizations, static analysis is great for breath. By writing rules, developers can surface problems across the entire code base. This is why ESLint is so great. The trade-off is that we can't predict how slow an operation will be without actually running it, making it impossible to implement million lint solely as a compiler. This is a really interesting callout, and I'm going to call back to something a little bit weird, which is the TypeScript performance tools that I referenced in another video. In this video, I actually benchmark TypeScript. But since TypeScript, the type part, lives in that type layer, the runtime is the TypeScript compiler in the type layer. So you can get really good performance numbers by analyzing the types, which is interesting because the compiler is actually doing performance, but the only thing that your compiler can measure the performance of is the compiler itself. 
And what this measures, when you check the depth of a type and the instantiation necessary to resolve a type, you're checking how many steps the TypeScript compiler goes through to get the result. So in this case, the runtime you care about is the compiler, so you can test that through the compiler and get numbers through the compiler. But if we're running that code somewhere else that isn't the compiler itself, the compiler can't tell how it will perform. It can apply rules and checks to guess about certain performance issues, but you'll never actually know what the performance looks like just through the compiler. So you have to do some amount of measurement at runtime which is what they call it here. Another approach is thus instrumenting at runtime. The advantage here is that we can directly run the app and get rendering information via the React Fiber. So many of the complexity challenges with static analysis are solved instantly. However, the trade-off with runtime is that you don't have the original source unless you use source maps, which are very painful and slow. God, I, I could do a long video about source maps. Which hook or prop caused this change? Which part of the component re-rendered? We couldn't answer these questions without the source code itself. It's a hard balance to find, which is why they search for a better way. So we went back to the drawing board. For MillionLint, we asked ourselves, how can we have the best of both worlds? We needed to create a profiling experience that didn't hog build time or runtime, then support for a debugging flow that helped developers find performance problems and fast. Our answer is dynamic analysis, using both static analysis and runtime analysis where it makes sense. Instead of filtering top-down, we follow the necessary data flow to understand each component render and build up from there. This resulted in our custom instrumentation library designed specifically for React apps import million compiler from at million slash lint. The million lint experience starts with a compiler running dynamic analysis on individual React components. First, the compiler interjects handlers. We'll start with the raw source, your typical count, set count, use state, use effect, yada, yada. Can't really do much with this though. So the compiler sneaks in these million dot capture calls that wrap everything so that it can measure at runtime what the performance actually looks like. During runtime, these inject handlers capture rendering, timing, and metadata information as you interact with your web app in dev mode. With this approach, we can get runtime profiling data from running the app itself while keeping access to the source code thanks to the JavaScript compiler step itself. Makes sense. Pseudocode of the collected data. So this is what the data it collects would end up looking like. After capturing the renders, we extend the compiler to asynchronously collect bundle, network, and state manager information without build time overhead. These real-time insights are then fed into the VS Code extension where you can see the collected information and suggestions to fix it. I think one of the most interesting insights here is this relationship between the VS Code extension, the compiler, and the runtime, where these three parts aren't necessarily tied together great in any other experience where like the React dev tools can tell you a lot about what the React code looks like once it's in the browser and how it's behaving there, but it won't bring that info back to VS Code. It doesn't know anything about your compiler. As such, none of the tools that exist for solving these problems really give you the, the insight on each part. And the idea of running code in my browser and then getting the feedback back in my editor, that's really exciting. <laughs> and I'm excited to play with it. So here we see the render information. Let's play the snippet. You're getting all of this feedback built into your editor of all the times it's running in the browser, as well as bundle size information too, where you see how big the bundle impact is for each of these imports. There have been other extensions that do this, and most of them are wrong. Since this actually relies on the compiler itself, it's a lot more performant and capable. Uh, an important call out, I could never miss this. Igor is actually the creator of the theme that they used for all of these million screencasts in this here, which is really cool because Igor makes really cool color themes. I should probably consider using his, but uh, I, my, my loyalty will always stick with the Point Manders crew. I love them too much. But yeah, Igor's theme is also very good. I'll leave a link to that in the description if you want it. These guys know what they're doing and they're deep in this stuff. So lastly, we made Lint++, which feeds the collected information into a language model to discover optimization opportunities. So even if you don't know what you're doing, Million Lint will show you how. Okay, I like this a lot because if most current startups wrote this article, Here's what they would have written. AI fixes React dev, buy it now. This is what everyone does with these AI startups. But AI isn't the thing they're selling here. It might actually be the thing they're charging for. I haven't gotten far enough yet. But AI is just an implementation detail to them. It's just a thing that they used to provide a good experience. But the focus is on the experience they're providing, not on the fact that AI and language models happen to be a small part of the tooling. Because that's not even the interesting part of the tooling here. And as a Y Combinator 2024 company in the current YC batch, you would think they'd lean all into the, look at how we're using AI. But I'm gonna see when AI comes up on the page. It's gonna be annoying because Aiden's name, it doesn't. I put a space in front. Nope, the word AI does not appear on this page other than me inserting it here, which I love. So let's hear how they're actually using that language model though, because I'm curious. 
So Lint Plus Plus feeds the collected information into a language model to discover optimization opportunities. So even if you don't know what you're doing, Million Lint shows you how. They have another one of these snippet videos here. Consider wrapping the React Markdown component in Use Memo. Hey, I want to see more about that. Cool. In Use Memo to prevent unnecessary re-renders when the props haven't changed. I think I would have that in Memo, not Use Memo, but teach their own. Consider using React Virtuoso for virtualizing the notes list to improve performance with large lists. Is React Virtuoso the go-to now? I haven't done a virtualized list in React for a bit. Yeah, it seems like it's in a really good state. I used to use the React Virtual, React Virtualize, whatever the tan stack one was. But this seems to be in a better state overall. Still getting releases of last week. Cool. What other examples do they have here? Debouncing. Filter input. For smoother performance, especially with large data sets or expensive operations, consider debouncing the filter input. Use two states, one for the immediate input control and another for debounced updates. More good advice. Instead of creating a new function for on note activated every render, pass the note ID directly to the note button and let it handle the activation. Yeah, not as big a deal, but fine. Use the past note ID prop to create a stable on note activated callback within note button. Yeah, I guess if you combine those, that is a nice win. This is reminding me specifically, though, I cannot wait for the React compiler to handle all of those things for us. There are still performance wins that an external compiler can't do for you, but having a tool like this that suggests better practice to you is awesome. It's like a, a guided, hey, you can do this better. I'm actually really excited about AI tools like this because they're not trying to replace your developers or convince you that developers aren't necessary or any of the other things AI tools are trying to replace. They're trying to help you level up. They're trying to help you be better, more efficient, developer writing better code. This fits a lot closer to Copilot and a lot less close to like Devon or these other crazy write an app from scratch AI tools. But how good is this actually? How good is Lint++? Measuring the objective quality of Lint++ requires a non-trivial data set. So we're working on an open source React web app optimization benchmark for code gen models, which is coming soon. Interesting. They're making a benchmark for React web app optimization for AI tools that want to optimize stuff. This also, I'm assuming, would be good for testing the React compiler, React forget, whatever you want to call it now, when it eventually comes out. For now, we've tested Lint++ Plus plus on a dozen in-production products between our friends. For a public example, Lint++ plus plus was able to identify and suggest the correct fix to every problem in a slow educational React app our friend Yvonne had built. Different Yvonne from the one I mentioned earlier. This Yvonne. He works at Framer. He actually is a web perf engineer at Framer, which makes him find success with this even cooler. So here is an example app that he had built. It's a performance workshop that's meant to showcase things that are slow to see if you can figure out how to fix them. And it seems like Lint++ plus plus can figure it out. So once they ran this on Yvonne's Notes app, it labeled the following problems across six components. Unstable references as prop optimizations, memoizing expensive components, caching inline functions, suggesting virtualization, suggesting use context selector for use context. I could do a long video about this one. Let me know in the comments if you want to hear about all the right and wrong ways to use context, especially as it changes over time, because context is about to get weird. They also have the point of moving context providers up the tree. Interesting. I'm curious. I'll have to... Am I going to dig into this and look? I'm curious now. I search provider in this code base. Let's see all the places that they're being mounted. Not Saga. <laughs> so uh, they missed the most important performance improvement they could do. Light Redux Saga on fucking fire. Yeah. I don't want to read a Saga code base. We're stopping here. So to be clear, my issue isn't Redux. It's Redux Saga. Redux is fine, especially Redux Toolkit. RTK is dope. Redux Saga is a disaster and no one recommends it anymore. The, the code base is actually dead. Like it's like Redux Saga was an awful generator syntax and way of architecting async. So if I understood correctly, it's that this dark mode context is mounted too low. So I'm guessing it has to rerun. Oh, it's, it's past a value? What value is it past? Yeah, why is all of this at the root of app? Yeah, okay, I'm seeing the issues here that there's all of these other things that exist above the actual provider. Yeah, duh. Fair call out. I know a lot of devs would have totally missed this, but like you shouldn't have all of this state on top of a provider that injects things into your whole app. You link this out, wrap everything, and then dump this. So like the real quick fix here would be literally just rename app to internal app or like contents or something. Make app literally just this dark mode provider and its child be those contents probably worth memoizing it too and then you fix that and apparently it's the mode set mode in that provider that is the issue because it's not a stable value those should be stable they're coming straight from the react state do they become unstable when this has to re-render unnecessarily those should be stable values i see no reason why these wouldn't be stable value is a new object oh oh good catch i totally missed that okay you're making the point the thing i missed and cool you, you caught me const value equals use memo mode set mode mode set mode and pass this instead 
Yeah, that's a decent optimization. Good call. Especially if this provider is re-rendering unnecessarily, this is necessary to not be unstable. Good call. I'll take the L. Let's hear more about MillionLint. We invited an engineer who's never seen the code base before to try and speed up the notes app. Using MillionLint, he 3x the performance of the main page after around 15 minutes of work. That's pretty cool. Having an engineer that had uh, never seen the code base before just spend 15 minutes and make it three times faster. Oh God, yeah, you can you can see the chug there. <laughs> You ever seen the, the classic React keyboard lag when your input states are poorly synced with renders? Oh God, it's awful. <laughs> of course, Notes is a small app and MillionLint wouldn't always find the best fix for every problem. We're working hard to improve its quality. Try and please let us know about your experience. Important question. I'm pumped to see them addressing this head on. In the next few weeks, we'll open source the MillionLint compiler and the VS Code extension. Both the compiler and the in-editor annotations are free to use forever. Our focus is to build a great developer tool, and we believe that the best way to build a great developer tool is to build it in the open. To earn a living, we'll be charging for the Lint++ service at $20 per month for 100 Lints. For more frequent users, we are still working on the details, but the idea is to charge based on the number of Lints you translate to code. We believe this aligns our incentives with yours. You only make money when we make your app faster. I love this too. And uh, call out for those who haven't made a startup before, Pricing fucking sucks. Specifically, like usage-based pricing is really, really hard to figure out. Both like the economics in a way that doesn't like bankrupt you, but also marketing in a way that people see the number and don't freak out. Because I know that $20 per 100 lints might sound terrible, but when you think about this in terms of 100 changes to your code base, it gets a lot less terrible. 20 bucks for 100 changes that make your code better is actually a pretty good deal. And I know Twitch would spend thousands of dollars, for example, if they could make the code faster for every single dollar spent. Just to think about. So, the road to Million Lint 1.0. We are still in the very early days of experimentation. MillionLint focuses on solving unnecessary re-renders right now. We understand this is not a problem for long. Yeah, uh, this is a link to, I'm assuming, the React compiler. Yep, they, they know what's going on. They're not going to let themselves fall behind. MillionLint focuses on solving unnecessary re-renders right now, and we will move to handling slowdowns arising from the React ecosystem. State managers, animations, bundle sizes, waterfalls, etc. Our eventual goal is to create a tool chain which keeps your whole web infrastructure fast, automatically, front end to back end. One change I'd recommend making if you guys are hard coding anything here, it's a, a really simple change. Uh, I'll pseudocode it quick. If package.json.includes Redux Saga, Throw new error. Come on, man, it's 2024. Yeah, this will help a lot, especially in the example that we just went through. Yeah. Anyways, we'd like to invite you on this journey with us to make the best possible web performance developer tool. Million Lint is our very first step. Try it out and let us know what pieces are missing. How can I help? Like me or the viewer? Either or. We're looking for talented front end and PL ML engineers to join us in the Bay Area. Ooh, Aiden, are you fully moved to the Bay? Is this the dropout announcement? Are you actually dropping out of school for this now? You full time here? Living in my city? You're in the Bay. Then why the fuck aren't you guys hanging out with me? How has Aiden been in this batch now for three months and you haven't been to my place once? Yeah, we'll talk later. Anyways, especially when I'm investing in you fuckers. <sighs> At Million, we have a simple thesis for software performance. We can build tools that make anyone a performance expert. Developers should think only of shipping features and fixing bugs, not keeping their code fast. We plan to start with React, then extend to the broader front end, back end, and other platforms. If you feel like you missed the beginning of Million.js, get in on this. The fun of the beginning is how much you get to shape everything. Yeah. It, this is the real benefit of getting into something early isn't the competitive advantage you get. It isn't that you can get a job really easy. It's that you get to help shape the direction of that thing. And you can actually help shape this because they're still very, very early. Anyways, Aiden, my bad, I'll visit you. <laughs> Damn fucking right, both of you guys. We'll figure it out next week. If you're not in utter fucking hell with the investor combo stuff, the million team. Congrats to all of y'all on getting through Y Combinator. Well, not through just yet, but getting to the end of Y Combinator, which is both the most stressful part and also the most fun in many ways. This has been a wild ride. I will admit I was more skeptical of this before going in, but uh, the more I read, the more you sold me. I see a future not only where I would use this, but I could actually see myself paying for it because it caught a mistake I would have missed. And that's pretty cool. We'd love to know what you guys think. I know another linter might not seem super exciting, but this isn't competition with the other linters. This is something fundamentally new, and that's why I'm hyped about it. So let me know what you think in the comments because I'm excited for this future. Until next time, peace nerds.